going to introduce our first guest now, um, and it's his second talk. Uh, it was a two-part talk we, we agreed on with him, and I put him off last time, uh, which he, you know, uh, uh, for the elections. So it, it's his second talk on on the building of a nationalist movement. For those that were at the first talk, you may remember. Um, it was uh, about, Martin alluded to, how it should be constructed and how it should be based on the principles and traditions of, of, Eng of English law, uh, etc. Um, and, and this is the uh, second part of Martin's talk uh, on building a nationalist movement. So please welcome Martin Webster. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Before I start my talk, I'd just like all of us to give a round of applause to Jeremy Turner and Richard Edmonds and any other folk who were down at Dover last week. I'm, I'm truly horrified to hear that peace-loving anarchists, uh, uh, by um, half a dozen of them, were having to avail themselves of the services of the National Health Service. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure we all feel for them very deeply. Now, I guess what I've got... The first part of my talk was theoretical. It was about explaining, from my point of view, how I thought that the culture and traditions of the British and specifically the English people had uh, developed over hundreds of years very differently from the history and cultural and legal traditions of, say, countries in Europe like Germany. Though we're kissing coven cousins from a racial point of view, our culture and uh, our general background and our, our general way of looking at the world is in many ways very different and therefore political parties in the different countries are going to have to develop to suit the needs and the values and the principles and the sympathies of their relevant people and uh, I felt that while the so-called Führer Prinzip which was inherent in German National Socialism may well be for all sorts of reasons which I went into in January, and which I won't reprise here again, um, may well have suited the German people at that time in view of their condition at that time and in view of their history. It doesn't necessarily mean that the success which the German National Socialist Movement achieved in the 20s and 30s is necessarily the formula which we can use to build a successful nationalist movement in Britain in the 21st century. That was the general theoretical uh, uh, line of my talk then. But of course, in order to consider how we might better build a nationalist political party as and when that development starts to occur, and it hasn't started to occur yet, so far as I know, um, it's necessary not only to deal in those theoretical matters, but to look at the history of the nationalist movement in the last 30, 40 years and to see what went on and who was significant and what they did and what they didn't do uh, in order to examine, we all know the successes that were achieved particularly by the National Front and it's going to be the National Front I'll be talking about mostly because in my view the National Front was the most important and most successful potentially successful nationalist movement in Britain since the Second World War. And if you want to get any sort of verification of that, simply look to see the extent of the organised criminality, violence, smearing and mayhem deployed against the National Front, instigated in the first instance by the Board of Deputies of British Jews, and then transmitted through the Labour Party, the construction of the Anti-Nazi League, and all the rest of it, uh, the level of opposition which the NF sustained was a criminal conspiracy of vast proportions. I mean, the movies of the riots against us are there for all to see, and no other movement uh, since then has been subjected to that kind of pressure. So it seems to me that if the ultimate enemy 
uh, is prepared to mobilize itself in that way against the National Front, which it's never, that sort of opposition has never been replicated against any subsequent nationalist movement. There's been opposition, of course, but nothing like that at that scale, with the whole of the media rioting on the streets. They, those of you around at the time will know the mayhem we had to endure. Uh, it seems to me that the National Front was the great, the, the, rather the disappearance of the National Front, the implosion of the National Front is one of the great tragedies in the history of the nationalist movement in Britain. And we need to discuss and consider what mistakes were made that allowed that to happen. And I'm aiming my analysis on the idea that there are some nationalists who believe that the Führer princip principle of organizing a political party, whereby one man, in Portugal they used to refer to Salazar as the one, with a finger pointing in the air, with big H, he was the one. Um, now, things like that may well be useful and necessary and work in Portugal or in Germany, but as I explained, for reasons which I went into in some detail, and you can look them up on YouTube, um, I say don't apply and won't bring a response from the British people who have a lively sense of fairness and of justice hundreds of years before those ideas percolated uh, the political systems of other countries in Europe. Uh, there are arguments to be made for the Führer Princip, i.e. one man having absolute power over absolutely everything, and we all look up to him. I don't think we any of us have yet said, or her, but who knows, um, uh, that, that everything that flows from the mouth of this person is right, and we all bow down on the door. Führer befehl wir folgen dir, was the, uh, the slogan. That may be all very right and apposite, and useful and inevitable for Germany in the 1920s and 30s, bearing in mind the agonies that country had gone through and bearing in mind how different its history was compared to ours. Well, my point is that I don't think it applies uh, in Britain in the 21st century and I don't think it applies or is relevant to the spirit and culture of the British people in any century. And you can't really examine the advocation of the Führer Princip in British nationalist political circles without considering the career of John Tyndall, because he was the great exponent in the post-World, post-Second World War era of the Führer Princip in politics. Now, I fully appreciate that some of the comments I'm going to make uh, about this are going to cause dismay, perhaps even irritation amongst some of you. Oh, I'm very sorry about that, but I work, I got to meet John Tyndall and the nationalist movement, the more radical element of the nationalist movement at any rate, in 1962, and I lived with it and sustained contact with people like John Tyndall uh, until the very early 1980s, and I saw a lot, and I heard a lot, and I experienced a lot. Now, some of you go to uh, these annual John Tyndall commemorations. Uh, we all of us need heroes in our lives. We all want to feel that our movement has got <coughs> antecedent individuals who uh, we can look up to. But from my point of view, from my experiences, these, uh, this is very much reminiscent to my mind of a cult activity. Like the Roman Catholics go to Fatima or to Lourdes to worship uh, Our Lady, or the uh, Muslims go to Mecca on the jihads. And I get the impression that the John Tyndall Commemoration Society meetings uh, are very much in that spirit. And they're attended by people, many of whom never met John Tyndall and were certainly weren't around in the National Front in the 1970s. Uh, but they have a need for 
some sort of cultural icons uh, to uh, venerate, uh, sort of a secular saint, if you like. It's rather reminiscent, those of you who have read Animal Farm, the first pig who brought the animals together to articulate the ideals of animalism to the animals. Uh, he conveyed these ideas to the animals and then he died. But when the animals had their little revolution, they dug up his skull and once a year they um, had commemorations of this early, uh, the, the animal in that case was uh, intended by George Orwell to be uh, Karl Marx. That was the Karl Marx figure in the story. So we've got this thing and you can't analyse the successes and failures of the nationalist movement without analysing the successes and failures of the departed John Tyndall. The process of developing uh, these, this cult worship of John Tyndall, as some would like to promote it. I don't know whether there's any financial benefit derived by those who are organizing these meetings. I've no idea about it. I've never attended any, surprisingly. But uh, the process is a psychological process. These meetings have a psychological purpose. They're not political. They are a cult activity. And as I say, I approach the consideration of John. He's important, and therefore his successes and his failures are important because he was significant in the movement. You couldn't consider the uh, development, say, of the NSDAP in Germany without considering the career of Hitler. So, uh, you know, um, there are some people, I, I remember that um, after my first talk, uh, somebody who's not here today, um, maybe it's his little protest, he approached me after my first talk and said, oh, next time you speak, Martin, you'll go easy on JT, won't you? <laughs> no, I won't. I'll go as easy on JT as JT went easy on me. And you know how easy that was. <laughs> because unless we learn from the career and from the mistakes of important individuals in our movement, then if, as and when the opportunity comes, as you were talking about a little earlier, about building a new party, those who don't, it's, it's a, a, a tired cliche, but it is true, those who don't strive to learn from the errors of the past are deemed to repeat them. Now, personal incidents, when you're dealing with individual, political parties are groups of individuals who've got to relate with one another. And when, you're, when I first met Tyndall, I was 19, and I, I continued with him in the NS sort of environment uh, for three years after that, 21. When you're that age, you are less willing to be uh, confrontational, particularly with an older person. Um, and I, I have to say that had I had the experience I've got now, then, then I, one or two incidents that happened to me vis-a-vis -vis Tyndall should have made me say, you're a rotter, you're a cad, you're selfish, and I don't want to have anything to do with you. I'll give you an example of what I mean. Um, I may have mentioned last time that when I organised the demonstration against Jomo Kenyatta when he came over here for the Commonwealth Prime Minister's Conference, because the, the Greater Britain movement, which Tyndall had formed, was becoming moribund, and I realised unless something hit the headlines very quickly, we were just going to evaporate. Uh, so I devised this idea of jostling Jomo outside his hotel in Park Lane, and I thought, well, we need some dosh to get a paper going and various other things, so I came to an agreement um, or without discussion with Tyndall, um, with a press agency, and they agreed to pay us in cash uh, 400 pounds, which in back in 19, what was it, 63 or 64, I forget now, was a little bit worth a little bit more than it is uh, now. Um, and I knew, that, and then I broke the news, what I'd organized with Tyndall, and uh, uh, he 
okayed it. Um, I thought that I, I was going to go away for it for a little bit. Uh, in fact, the courts were very kind to me, and they, I think the magistrate gave me the lowest sentence he possibly could have done. But even so, going to prison, even only for 40 days, for a, a middle-class 20-year-old or 21-year-old is, uh, you know, quite a traumatic experience. And I would have thought that my comrade, John Tyndall, would have kept back a fiver or a tenner for me so that when I came out of prison, I wouldn't be absolutely <coughs> potless and on the bones of my arse. But that's exactly what happened. He'd spent the lot. Uh, most of the money was spent on publishing the first issue of Spearhead, which then, that first issue, if any of you have seen it, came out as a broadsheet. It didn't become a magazine until issue two. And after that, uh, a year or so later, I came into a small inheritance from an auntie, and um, I gave £1,200 to the GBM to get the magazine Spearhead going. And then another, uh, a few months after that, another significant sum, a few hundred pounds. And as a result of all that, Tyndall promised me, oh, give me just a, a few months, but you put up capital. I certainly had an equity in that enterprise, apart from the work and the writing I did for it. Um, he would make me a shareholder in Albion Press, which was the publishing firm which... Um, produce Spearhead, it never, ever happened. Never, ever happened. Now, an adult person with a little bit of experience of business life, having endured behaviour like that, firstly over the fine and then over the, the share thing, would have thought, well, this person, he's treating a comrade who's been generous to him in a shitty way, and I don't want to have anything to do with this man. But you don't say with that when you're young. You put the movement first, you put the idea first, and you try and bury these things in the back of your mind. And it's a mistake. You shouldn't allow yourself to... If people behave like that to you in, you might say, small personal ways, then what are they going to do in big issues where big money's involved and big power's involved in politics? Can they be trusted? And then I've got a, a subheading in this talk. They're just instances along the way. Some of you may remember John Kingsley Reid, who was chairman of the NF for a year. And he, Kingsley Reid was elected legally. He was lawfully entitled to hold that post until the next election. And we all advised Tyndall, look, the man's a crook. He's a spear I dubbed him the gypsy horse dealer. In, in Spearhead. Um, he's, he's, he's a busted flush. Be patient, he'll be out in a year. The members will vote him out again. But Tyndall was so annoyed about losing his chairmanship that he couldn't wait, he couldn't be patient. And he organised a group of his uh, more avid supporters to invade the headquarters of the National Front and occupy it and keep staff out of the building. So that when uh, the people who were opposed to Kingsley Reid, who had all been expelled purportedly by Kingsley Reid, took Kingsley Reid to the High Court, we had a wonderful case, but we very nearly <coughs> lost it, not on the basis of the case of what Kingsley Reid had done and what he'd done wrong and all that sort of thing, but Kingsley Reid's lawyers argued that these people are coming to court with dirty hands, that they tried to fix the outcome of this issue by means of violence, occupying the party's headquarters, behaving illegally and improperly. Uh, and it took a hell of a job from our barrister to persuade the judge that though uh, that behaviour by Tyndall and his friends was bad, uh, it didn't represent the behaviour of all of the applicants in that particular matter. And so on the balance of fairness, the judge allowed our case to go ahead. We won, we kicked, uh, got uh, injunctions against King Reed, and off he went. When uh, we'd uh, got rid of Kingsley Reed legally through, our, through the justice system, 
um, we had an election for our national directorate. Now, normally, I was left with the job of organising the ballot paper for national directorate elections. They're often very long documents, about that long. Uh, and I, uh, in, in accordance with our constitution, those ballot papers were strictly fair. They were in alphabetical order, and everybody had space to put in all of the jobs that they'd done for the party, the positions that they had held or they were currently holding, so people get some clue as to their service to the party. Uh, and they were always, the, the ballot papers were organised on that basis with no favouritism uh, shown at all to anybody. Uh, Tyndall said to me, after the Kingsley Reid matter, and we were coming to our first post-Kingsley Reid elections to the National Directorate, oh, leave that to me, Martin, you've got something else to do, I, I, I'll attend to this. So when I went with John Tyndall and uh, a new colleague who Tyndall had recruited to our head office, Richard Verrill, some of you remember him, we went up to Alpha Graphic, the um, graphic design chap, uh, Peter McNenemy. Some of you remember, may you remember Peter McNenemy, who did our wonderful posters for the National Front in the, in the old days. And we went to Peter's office in Streatham to collect the artwork for the ballot paper before sending it down to Tony Hancock in Brighton. And Peter McNenemy drew me aside and said, you better look at that ballot paper before you send it off. And what Tyndall had organised is the ballot paper, big thing, but there's a big bold line around six or seven names with a notice at the top, these people are the people who've supported John Tyndall through thick and thin with this battle for Kingsley Reid, and they are certainly people you should vote for. Now, the other people below this bold line of ballot people are all probably very nice, valued people, and you may, spare, you may have enough votes to spare one or two of these people, but the people at the top are solid gold on a ballot paper, and there was a hell of a row. Um, now, Richard Verrill had been recruited, along with Beryl Mitchell, uh, who you may remember. They'd been recruited by Tyndall to the head office um, in order to act as a watch on me. Oh, do come and sit down. Um, and... According to Richard Verrill, if any of you meet him again, he will recollect this matter. There was the most terrible row in the cafe below Peter McNenemy's office, and it opened Richard's eyes to the style that uh, John Tyndall was purporting. And Richard joined in on my side, which Tyndall didn't expect at all. He expected Richard to be totally adoring. But uh, Richard had a sense of fairness. That word creeping in again, our old British word, fairness. See, and Tyndall realised that he'd gone too far, just as he did by sending the gang of heavies in to take over the party's headquarters a year or so before. He'd gone too far with the ballot paper like this. And um, he had to accept that the thing would have to be completely reset along the lines that we'd always done it. And so everybody, whoever they were, was down there in alphabetical order. And all of the people that Tyndall wanted to see elected were elected. But it was done fairly. Then, a little bit later, we came to a sequence of events which I thought was particularly revealing because they were not only of the personal nature, but they were of the political nature. There was a, what I call the Charles Parker saga. John Tyndall had met a, a, a young lady, a divorcee. Um, do you know, I forget her first name now. What Valerie, was she? Valerie. Valerie, Valerie Parker, uh, the daughter of Charles and Violet Parker. And Parker was, um, had money, he owned properties in Brighton, he was a landlord, and he was uh, certainly, you could say that by marrying uh, Valerie, um, Tyndall had secured his financial future. And it was therefore important to Tyndall that he keep in with his father-in-law. Now, 
Charles Parker got himself nominated to stand in the direct elections to the National Directorate. Um, and I'm a very trusting, believing, naive sort of a fellow, as you all know. And Parker rang me up and said that he had secured a £4,000 donation to the Sussex Regional General Election Fund. Uh, that it was one of his business associates and through negotiating with this person who, because he was deeply involved in business, uh, didn't want to come out in public but was prepared to support the Brighton region branches with, you know, good dosh. And, I, and the money was certainly there, had been paid in, I checked that out, and I believed the story. It was a pack of lies designed to get Charles Parker, International Front News, as somebody so clever who could use his business background and contact in order to raise large sums of money for the National Front. That's how I wrote it up. You always want to tell a good story about your own people. In fact, the money was gratuitously donated to the party at her own initiative by a woman who lived in Lewis called Betty Webb, who had a sister uh, in the NF as well, and she told Parker, who was the regional organiser at that time, look, I can give you this money to help put up candidates about in the Sussex area, but I don't want you to mention my name because I don't want branches from all over the country coming and knocking on my door wanting money as well. So keep it quiet. So on the basis that Parker knew that the real donor of this money, who he hadn't shut it up for it, she'd come to him out of the blue. She wanted to keep herself anonymous, so he realised he was able to invent this lie, sell it to me and get it to published in National Front News. And when eventually I got to hear that I'd been tricked and that the membership had been tricked and that the voters in the forthcoming directorate elections had been tricked by this lie, Tyndall was furious that I should raise the matter, absolutely furious, and would not take any action against his father-in-law at all. And then, after the election took place, Parker didn't get himself elected. He was an ignoramus. He knew nothing of nationalist policy. He was a little bit of a part-time Methodist lay preacher, and he or claimed to be, but this is another lie, which I'll come to in a minute, an important Freemason. And he thought that was going to endear himself to us. <laughs> uh, but Parker didn't get elected, and Parker was furious at not getting elected, and he thought, what's the point of me marrying off my daughter to the chairman of the National Front if I can't get myself on the governing body? But that's how these people think, you know. And um, Tyndall uh, used to spend most of the week down in his gazebo at Brighton with the old coffee pot boiling and he's typing out uh, British Porridge, Time for New Thinking, part 98, on the old um, desktop computer there. And he'd only come into the office on a Tuesday just to pick up his expenses and to just to have to see how things are going and pick up the gossip. And he came in one Tuesday and went into the office which um, Richard Verrill and I used and said, I'd like to have your uh, <coughs> cooperation, uh, Richard and Martin. Um, uh, you know that I have Charles Parker as my father-in-law now, or forthcoming father-in-law, and it's very important to me and to the, and probably to the party that uh, we keep on the best side of this man, and um, we need to uh, get him onto the directory was unfortunately unsuccessful in the elections. He came right way down unsuccessful. And Tyndall's idea was to co-opt Parker onto the directorate by means of securing a vacancy. And Tyndall pointed out to us that in our constitution there was a little regulation which said that if a directorate member, once elected, doesn't turn up regularly and sufficiently to directorate meetings, they could be dismissed. And guess who Tyndall proposed 
fitted that category to be dismissed, to create a, uh, a vacancy for his father-in-law, our friend Richard Edmonds, who got fed up, and I can understand Richard getting fed up. Well, leave my name out of this, Martin. Leave my name out of it. It's been listed, and it's a fact. I was never we, sent off the directors. Uh, you weren't, thanks to Richard Verrill and myself. I know nothing of that. You know, of course you don't. Nonsense. Just leave my name out of it, Martin. Leave my name out of it. It's, Say what you want, but leave my name out of it. Well, it's, it's, it's registered as a fact. That didn't work either. Then we had people coming up to us there were a group of people in the West Midlands who were asking this trouble that with, with Charles Parker, is it that glinty ring that he keeps on showing around? And the glinty ring was a Freemasonic ring, which he used to advertise the fact that he was a Freemason. And he gave the impression that he was a Freemason. In fact, he wasn't. He was never a Freemason. He bought the ring from a person in Brighton, uh, or the wife of a man who died, who was an important Freemason in Brighton. And he simply bought the ring and flashed it around. For some reason, he was so ignorant of nationalist beliefs and values that he thought that if he could sell himself as an important Freemason, we would take him more seriously and promote him more quickly. Then we had a housing policy booklet, which JT produced. Now, how many of you people have been or are now tenants of private landlords? Yeah, one or two of you, one or two of you. Now, how would you feel if there was a law which said that any landlord could evict giving seven days notice any of his tenants for any reason or no reason at all, and if they, if they failed to vacate their premises within seven days, then the landlord would have the right to go to the nearest police station, summon a constable to assist bailiffs to evict that person. Now, would you consider that to be a law which any self-respecting party in Britain should advocate or promote? Do you think it would do them well? Well, that was one of the proposals in the booklet which John Tyndall produced. And in discussion with John Tyndall, and this happened at a directorate meeting, it turned out that most of the ideas for this booklet came from Charles Parker, who was on the executive committee of a landlord's organisation called Nationwide Housing Concern. And their concern was, of course, the best interests of landlords. And I cannot think of anything more outrageous and contrary to the principles of fairness and English law for such a proceeding. And JT wanted to have that booklet published to please his father-in-law, and he thought that we would accept it. We, that booklet was savaged at the directorate meeting. And in fact, at the end of that directorate meeting, a resolution was carried that not only would we not publish that booklet, that its text must either be destroyed or locked up in a safe and never opened. That was an actual resolution carried at a directorate meeting. And then we come to the general election. JT was quite convinced that the election was going to occur in September 1978. As we know, it didn't happen until 1979. We kept on talking to him about, we need to produce a manifesto. There's the possibility that one comes up. JT said, oh, no, 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 we, we, we've got our time. We can think about it. In fact, he was stalling us off because he was working very hard on producing a manifesto, which in, on the 25th of August, just before the August bank holiday weekend, he sprung on all of us. And I was just on that day going down to Cornwall to do a tour of branches in Devon and Cornwall. I had that flocked on me. 
And because it's a long train journey down there, I was able to go through uh, the book, writing comments about it, and I was astounded. I was reading policies in there that I don't think even the most reactionary right-wing Tory would dare to articulate in an election manifesto. They might try and sneak it in in the background. But let me give you some... I've just flipped through some of the pages. I, the whole thing would need to be thoroughly examined line by line, but I'll give you some proposals in this. He says, ban strikes with political objectives. Now, we expect to read that in the Daily Mail, but what about the Ulster workers' strike? Do you remember that? When the government was ready to betray Ulster and the whole of the workers, particularly in the dockyards, turned out in a massive strike there and that was stopped. The betrayal of Ulster was stopped by a massive workers' strike. JT's proposal would have uh, rendered that illegal. And what about a strike, if we could possibly uh, uh, contrive one, to get us out of the common market or to stop any further coloured immigration. If we could mobilise people for a massive nationwide strike to save the race and nation, that's a political objective. Would we not seize at the chance? We certainly would. But not according to JT. On another page, page nine, ban leisure pursuits which annoy others. <laughs> He was, of course, thinking of pop con. He, he was, of course, thinking of pop concerts. But you don't have to attend them, do you? And then something which I regard on, on page 10 as rather sinister. Quote, set sensible limits for party conflict. His idea was that parties should not disagree with one another. They should have a unified line. Uh, and pursue that in the national interest. Well, that isn't then a democracy. There's no point in having political parties. People have different opinions about what the national interest is. So that is simply a glib rationalisation for let's have a dictatorship. On page 13 of this document, he says, we must create a society in, in which everybody has some opportunity to succeed and the word some is emphasized by him not by me some opportunity to succeed so what happens about the nationalist principle which is discussed elsewhere including by him of meritocracy uh, we'll come back to this some opportunity in just a minute on page 32 Profit sharing to be counterbalanced by rules under which workers will bear a share of losses. Can you imagine the implications of that? I mean, we've got the John Lewis partnership where if the firm does well, a bonus is shared out amongst everybody. And if the firm does badly, then obviously nobody can be paid a bonus. But the idea that if the workers are entitled to get a bonus if the firm's doing well, they've got to pay for the losses of the firm if it's administered badly or trading conditions which are outside the control of the ordinary employee. Ludicrous! But that's on page um, 32. On page 32A, and here we come back to some opportunity to, to, to succeed, Quote, enable heirs to obtain considerable duty relief on inherited assets. Oh, yes. Where's the sum opportunity? You, that arrangement would completely set in concrete a privileged financial elite. They would always have the commanding heights of the economy. And... Uh, the idea that you could have a society in which merit could properly be experienced in society, so there's some form of social modality, that's out the window. On page 36, a registered unemployed person must take any job offered after six weeks. And on page 36 again, if no job at all is available, 
the person must report to the agency for work on public amenities. So, and as I put it to Tyndall in, in the debate we had about this at the director level, I said, my father isn't likely to lose his job, but he's now, I think he was then, my father was then 59, 58, something of that sort. He'd fought his way across the Western Desert, Sicily, and up Italy. He'd worked all of his life, never had a job, but just supposing now, hit the firm which he works for, went belly up and he found himself at 59 without a job. Are you saying that he's got to take any job, sweeping the streets or something like that, in six weeks if it's offered to him? And if there's no such job available to him, then he's maybe got to, he's got to report to the local labour exchange. Well, they'll put him to work emptying dustbins or cleaning out urinals or, or, or public service work like that, utilities and services. He said, is that, what, is that how you think you would get middle-aged, middle-class, patriotic people to vote for us by saying that is how you would treat them if they didn't get a job in six weeks? Do you think that's going to get votes for anybody? And of course, these two proposals concerning the unemployed gives rise to the assertion that those two policies would allow for the reduction of national insurance contributions. So it's a dismantlement of national insurance and the benefits that provides. We know, of course, we don't want um, uh, immigrants of any kind to benefit from our benefit system, but we certainly want the people who've paid into it all their lives to be able to benefit from it. And if you're reducing the contributions going in, then the benefit system, in fact, starts to evaporate. And finally, the one that caught my eye particularly, and this should have impact with nationalists, in 39 he says, we are pledged to reduce the share of the state in the business life of the nation. Oh really? Is that what nationalists are pledged to? There's no, there was no such resolution to such an effect ever carried at any NFAGN. But if the suggestion is that we should allow the banking system, the private banking system, to carry on operating as it has been doing for yonks and yonks now, and which was the principal cause of the terrible calamity which uh, the uh, financial system experienced in 2007, 2008, the idea that the state hasn't got any place in the business life of the nation is just a lot of stuff and nonsense. But the election didn't come in 1978, so we were able to put this to directorate meetings analysis, and it got shredded. And a quite different, more nationalist election manifesto was produced. Now, it was Tyndall's it was evident from this manifesto, if he'd got it published, that this was a way of trying to signal to big money, oi, we're up for grabs. And I, I never got a better signal that that was his intention, was when he and I were invited by a leader writer of the Sunday Express, before he got taken over by this awful Jew, Richard Desmond, um, for a state lunch at the Angus State Bar in Leicester Square. And we were discussing our various policies and the economy. And I came up with a phrase on the lines of, if I can find it here in my notes, we believe that business and finance exist to serve the nation. The nation does not exist to serve the business and to serve business and finance. That is what distinguishes us from Tories. And I started to get kicks on my shin under the table. Tyndall was kicking my shins and trying to get me to stop saying that. So when I take that incident with the content of this 
manifesto which he hoped to be able to foist on us at a time when we wouldn't have enough time to properly consider it and produce alternatives. He was wrong there. The election didn't come for another year. I realised that JT's attitude was that really he wanted to make the National Front up for grabs for big business. And it was at that point that he decided that the Führer Principle procedure that he wanted, the change of the constitution, the abolition of the elected national directorate and replaced by leadership by one man who could promulgate any policy he want or scrap any policy that he didn't like, who could promote any person he liked and who could dismiss any person he disliked. Those sort of powers are what Führer Princip means in practice, and that's what he wanted. He was fed up with not being able to get his father-in-law fiddled on to the National Directorate. He was fed up with not being able to write the party's manifesto without any challenge from any of his colleagues on the National Directorate. He was fed up with being contradicted uh, on a great number of matters, and that is the reason why, come the October, I think it was, 1979 annual general meeting of the National Front, he put forward his resolution of, it was an enabling act, it was the Führer Principe resolution, which I discussed with you last time, and you know that it, it, it needed a two-thirds majority to get carried at all. It didn't even get anywhere near a simple majority, his thing. And then explosions came. And eventually, Tyndall was so furious at not getting his own way that he led the split out and away from the National Front. And that led to the party's diminution and implosion. I don't think that is the way you should carry on politics. I do think that the constitution which the NF had protected it from being abused by somebody who was using the party for very narrow personal objectives. And I do feel that if a nationalist movement, I'm nearly finished now, if a nationalist movement is to congeal, come together. <coughs> Not only its political policies must be agreed, but it must have a constitution which protects the party, which protects its policies, and does not allow tyrants to hold sway, because when Tyndall, in his time, in a fit of hubris, allowed Nick Griffin to stand against him, in the directorate election of September 1999, and Tyndall felt that nobody's going to vote me out. And in fact, the party did so quite uh, joy not joyously in all cases, but uh, quite considerably. That constitution which Tyndall had provided the BNP, with a few bells and whistles added by Griffin, enabled Griffin to set up the kleptocracy which the BNP became. So the, while the wickedness and thefts and conmanship of Griffin are down to Griffin's responsibility, the opportunity for him to behave like that was created by <coughs> Tyndall with his Führer Principe constitution. Now, I'm, I've already had uh, objections to my uh, expressing my recollections from my friend Richard Edmonds, you can say what you like, Martin. It's down to you. I object to my name being called into this. Well, you were a part of the scene. You were a public person, Richard. And you can't be a public person and not have your name mentioned. You were talking about things I know nothing about. So well, you've learned, in that case, you've learned something. Don't bring my name into it. Don't bring my name into it. Say what you will, but don't bring my name into it. We've all got the chance. So, I said at the very beginning of this that I didn't expect this talk to go down like uh, sweet warm syrup for all of you, but that wasn't my purpose. 
Those are my experiences. Those are the things that I heard said and saw done before my very eyes. I lived through all of that. I even had Helen Tyndall, Tyndall's mother, who knew me well, come to head office with uh, Beryl Mitchell, take me over the road for a drink, which is something she didn't do because she was a, a Protestant Christian woman, bought me a drink and begged me to try and interfere with Tyndall's relationship with Valerie Parker. She said, they're awful people, they're going to destroy the party, they're going to... Uh, and I said, look, I know nothing of the Parkers at this time, and if Tyndall falls in love with somebody and wants uh, to get married, that's his business. I'd no more dream of interfering in his private life than I would expect him to want to interfere in mine. It's a matter for him. But if things got to the stage where the Tyndall's mother was prepared to come to the office and lobby me to interfere like that, you'll realise that something was going on very unhappily. I know this is going to be difficult for some of you to digest, and not all of you are going to welcome it, but that's what I saw and that's what I experienced, and I don't withdraw a word of it. Thanks for your attention. Uh, thank you, Martin. Um, yeah, you know... Uh...